The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, thank you for joining us for the Perceived Quality in the Digital Design World webinar presented by Icona Solutions. My name is Eric Galina and I'm the editor of Car Design News. Icona Solutions will shortly present Aesthetica, their unique and innovative solution which helps designers produce realistic images of real world products, including materials, colors, and finishes, in order to enable early perceived quality reviews. With us we have Dr. John Maxfield, Technical Director of Icona Solutions, who will demonstrate its positive impact on the efficiency and effectiveness of product development teams, including the assembly and manufacturing variation in the design process, to allow you to optimize craftsmanship and perceived quality. Dr. Mansfield has successfully implemented these processes with many leading automotive manufacturers and is considered to be an expert in the field of high quality visualization, perceived quality management, and design optimization. Before I pass over to John, I would like to remind all of you in attendance to draft up some questions which he and other panelists from ICONA will answer in the Q&A session following his presentation. Please ask these questions by typing them into the box in the lower right hand side of your screen. If you should happen to experience any technical issues during this session, please also type these into the Q&A box and our team will do their best to sort these out for you. If you're using a PC, be sure to check that the audio is not muted. We hope you'll find this webinar stimulating and informative. I'll now hand it over to John so he can begin the presentation. Thank you. John? Okay. Thank you, Eric. Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for taking time today to uh, attend this webinar. Um, I hope we'll be able to get your interest in uh, our software and also in our solution. And today we're going to focus specifically on the concept of perceived quality in a digital world. Um, the, the content of today's presentation will first of all focus on what is perceived quality um, and how the effects of materials, color, form, and variation can affect uh, perceived quality. In particular, we're looking at how buyers uh, are looking to, uh, to uh, have a buying experience, where they may be, for example, feeling cool or being happy, um, and how colors, texture, feel, smell, uh, comfort, sound, etc., uh, all play a part in, in the experience of perceived quality. And particularly, we'll be focusing on fit and finish quality, uh, gaps, reflection, and so forth. We'll then be looking at how uh, our solution um, from Icona Solutions um, plays a role in the assessment and management of perceived quality, and how our software can help you to assess the impact, particularly of manufacturing variation, on the perceived quality of products, and how this can then give design, engineering, production the opportunity to work together to solve these problems for the first time. Towards the end of the presentation, I'll also be providing you with some real-world examples of this and how Aesthetica can be, has been used by our existing customers um, to review perceived quality and the benefits that they've achieved as a result of this work. First of all, let's deal with the fundamental question of what is PQ? What is perceived quality? Does it mean feeling good? Does it mean standing out, reputation? Well, in fact, it means many things to many people, but perceived quality is really all about craftsmanship execution. It's about design excellence and customer satisfaction. And really, perceived quality is in the eyes of the consumer. We're all consumers, um, and we all have our own views on what we consider to be good quality. Luxury or quality for some is, is not the same as for others. Luxury for some may be small, uh, efficient, uh, maybe maybe about uh, uh, minimalism, whereas luxury for others may be about large, high quality, good fit and finish, good trim, um, high quality materials. We all have our own view on what perceived quality is, and different brands in different markets attract this problem in a different way. 
And this can be different depending on your age, can be different on your culture. For example, if we take a look at the uh, difference in the American and European markets, in Europe, uh, black is the most popular color for all for automotive uh, for, for vehicles, with 27% of all vehicles purchased being of uh, with black paint. Whereas if we look at North America, 18% of vehicles uh, have white paint. And so this is the most popular color over there. What we do know regarding perceived quality, however, is that PQ is everywhere. It's in every brand, it's in every product that we buy today, and it's all around us everywhere. If we focus on what does perceived quality mean for consumers of vehicles, it can mean many things in terms of interior and exterior. Here we can see some examples of what customers want to see in an interior. And the typical kind of uh, features that they would consider to be high quality, such as metal accents, two-tone materials, soft surfaces, sharp radii, unique grains, etc. And well-integrated uh, uh, electronics. And all of this all of these uh, add up to deliver uh, what a customer would consider to be a high perceived quality. But quality goes more than just about the selection of materials. Quality is also about how the, how the product looks and that can be affected by not just how it looks um, in the real world uh, in one environment but it may also affect how uh, the environment, uh, how, the, how the product looks in different environments as well. And digital technology is now available to allow us to assess uh, vehicles and products in a range of different environments, a range of different light settings with different types of paint finish, different types of uh, uh, materials. And this gives us the ability to look at products um, as the customer will be able to see them with very, very high quality. The issue here, of course, is that we're looking at perfect product. And what we're looking at right now is a perfect vehicle that visualized in different worlds. We all know, however, that perfect vehicles don't exist or perfect products don't exist in the real world. And actually what we do see in the real world is variation within the product itself. If you take a look at this image now, um, you can see, for example, we have an interior. And here we can see a perfect interior. But in reality, this interior may vary. And as you can see, as we move through some stages, as this interior varies, we can see how the fit and finish affects the appearance of this product. Not just, with diff not just in terms of the movement of the parts, but also when we try it with different material finishes as well. The misalignments and the, the, the various different conditions, uh, I'll just switch on my spotlight so you can see, we take a look at this edge line and these gaps, they're no longer meeting up. And as you can see, as we move through the different animations, the variation in manufacturing variation can affect the overall perceived quality of what was originally a very high quality uh, looking product. And this is the area that uh, Icona Solutions focuses on with respect to perceived quality. Our software, Aesthetica, is designed to allow you as designers at a very early stage of the process to understand the impact of manufacturing variation on the perceived quality of the product from the customer's perspective. The software does more than just moving components as we've seen in that previous example. Aesthetica is capable of simulating and visualizing all possible tolerance conditions and by this we mean all forms of variation, including deformation, and all forms of shape change in the, in, the, in the part. So we're not just looking at parts moving, we're looking at parts changing shape as well. And this is the reality of uh, manufacturing, particularly for interiors and exteriors, where we're increasingly using plastic components or flexible components within the product. And the ability to be able to understand form and profile variation as we move through the process will give us uh, not just an insight into how the parts are going to behave, but it also gives us great insight 
into what the final perceived quality is going to be for the user and whether we will be delivering the perceived quality we expect for this product and require. Now because Aesthetica can be uh, visualizes variation and can use data from all different stages of the process, it can be deployed in a very wide, um, uh, uh, sorry, across the entire product development process. And by this we mean all the way from concept through engineering to pre-production all the way down into production. And it can effectively reuse data from existing programs or previous vehicles to allow you to see how if you use the same manufacturing processes, those, those processes will affect the fit and finish of your product or the perceived quality of your product. This is a much wider range of use than traditional tolerance analysis, which requires a lot of detailed information about the product and is simply there to calculate the stack up or the numerical results of uh, the stack up of tolerances within the product. Aesthetica is designed to help you understand variation at a much earlier stage when in fact design can still, when, when uh, design still ha can be modified and changed. If we take a look at how design can in fact use our product, um, the typical inputs that users will, will, will um, bring into the product include uh, surface models, and this, this can come from a range of different products such as Alias, ISIM, ISIMSurf, Rhino, uh, or from CAD systems such as CATIA, NX, and PROE. And this data can be read directly into Aesthetica from the CAD system. Uh, together with what we call craftsmanship or specification targets and this is the set of um, ideal gap and flush values that are required for this vehicle and in particular the, the variation in the gap and flush that will be required. And this is read in together with a range of different appearances, color grains, maybe photographs of samples uh, and together this information then forms uh, a model within Aesthetica. Um, which you can then use to look at um, the craftsmanship targets or the gap and flush targets. And you can do this interactively within Aesthetica, but you can also look at this, uh, you can also generate uh, very high quality reports and also send that model out to high quality rendering, higher quality rendering tools to do ray trace rendering um, to look at the product in real world settings. Typical output may look something like this. So if you, once you've done your interactive review of the targets and agreed what the maximum minimum uh, gap and flush value should be, you can then save this out to an interactive report in say PowerPoint file format, which summarizes all of the gap and flush values within the product would have been agreed and also allows you to visualize as animations in that report the range of movement that you will see in the product. These reports can be produced automatically, they can be produced by the system and can be customized to match the documentation standards for any particular company. Now obviously doing this at the design stage is very, very valuable. It allows us to understand and analyze the sensitivity of a particular design uh, to variation. So we can see whether certain configurations or certain interfaces are going to be more sensitive to variation than others. And this also allows us to quickly and easily uh, agree and confirm uh, targets between the teams. And also to define an auditing process for the virtual model. Ultimately, it allows us to visualize the different configurations and from that we can, for example, undertake customer clinics or we can review worst case scenarios with, within our team to either tighten targets or loosen targets. And if we do this at the design stage, these, these changes may not just be about changing targets, we may also decide to make some changes to the surfaces to make the model more robust to variation. And using this technology, we can then undertake uh, more uh, we can then undertake design changes that will allow us to absorb that variation into the products much more effectively without introducing cost later in the process in terms of tooling, uh, in terms of changing the assembly process or the uh, manufacturing processes or materials. 
As we move further into the process, aesthetic, are allowed, uh, uh, this aesthetic model can grow in sophistication alongside the amount of data that becomes available. And as the, as the product moves into an engineering phase, um, the software is able to take the CAD data to get them with assembly, proposed assembly plans, measurement targets, and also uh, proposed tolerances for the model based on the manufacturing capability of the existing process. And with this information, Aesthetica is then able to, to undertake what we call verification studies. And these studies allow us to verify whether when we assemble the product, uh, will we achieve those targets that we originally set? And if we don't, what's causing the problem and can we fix that problem uh, by adjusting the model? This is a very quick and easy way of understanding what are we going to produce on the manufacturing line. And in this situation, Aesthetica is doing a full simulation of the manufacturing process and then showing us the results and showing us worst case examples that will come off the manufacturing line. And once again, once we have our interactive model, we do, uh, our customers do review using Aesthetic, but they're also able to produce uh, very detailed reports um, automatically from the system, which identify not just the range of variation, but the root causes, and also to analyze where the variation um, is coming from. Um, and also to do very high quality visualization of uh, simulation of parts, not just in their perfect state, but as we're saying before, in terms of deformed state and form variation. Um, so we can actually see the effect of that on the product very quickly and easily. This is an example of the type of report that may come out in terms of the summary. Um, you can see, for example, as, uh, the individual measurements are identified on the model. We can see, for example, on the, uh, on the, on the lower edge, uh, I'll just switch my highlighter on so I can show you. Um, you can see here within this table, we have a set of numbers here with traffic light systems identifying where perceived quality is good or bad. And we can use these, this then to drive further visualization, very high quality visualization of, uh, of the product to look at um, where, where things, um, for example, to look at individual problems and understand the root causes and identify whether they are going to be serious issues for the customer. Now, obviously, doing this at a later stage reduces the number of options you have for uh, fixing the model. You don't have to necessarily have design options for fixing the model anymore, but you still have the opportunity to come up with engineering or manufacturing solutions. And this may include verifying and optimizing locator strategies uh, to reduce the sensitivity to the variation and identifying uh, assembly concepts with consist that will deliver a consistent perceived quality, a, a consistent gap and flush consistency on the manufacturing line. And also to validate the impact of tooling changes. Um, so if, for example, um, you, you, you find that you have, for example, spring back or other types of uh, problems that are occurring on the manufacturing line, and those become uh, a big problem uh, to, for, your, for your new model, then you may want to try out new tooling changes within Aesthetica uh, and the effect of those tooling changes by modifying the tolerances in your model and seeing whether those will get the, those what if solutions will give you a better um, a result. But you can do it all digitally before ever producing any physical prototypes. And of course, this can then be communicated quickly and easily to suppliers or vice versa from suppliers to an OEM. Now, at this stage, um, often the difficulty with building models is the time it takes to build the simulation model. Now, with Aesthetica, we've spent a lot of time uh, working with uh, other software vendors who deliver, um, for example, my uh, live uh, uh, database system, database measurement systems for production, um, who capture, for example, the live uh, CMM data coming off the line and will allow you to, for example, um, uh, monitor the changes to the body on the production line. Um, we've been working with these companies for a number of years now and we're able to read in data directly from existing manufacturing processes uh, and, and apply that to a new vehicle 
in order to then do very rapid um, uh, uh, simulation of the effect of variation, but based on uh, real manufacturing data, real manufacturing live uh, data. And, and the benefit of this is obviously um, we can build the model much more quickly um, because we're, we're effectively, rather than having to assign tolerances to individual features and uh, build up a, a very detailed uh, complex stack of uh, assembly stack, uh, we can actually import all of this data into Athletic directly and then attach our new surfaces to that, that model and just test very quickly whether, whether that will deliver the perceived quality that we want, gap of lush. So these models can be built within hours rather than days or weeks. And this allows us to build the model very quickly and easily within Aesthetica while also reusing the data that's available within the process. And this includes not just loading in individual feature changes, but also, for example, how the manufacturing process works. So we can take in, for example, um, summary information from these database systems that, that model, for example, part shape change variation. So we can actually model, uh, so we can actually capture not just the part, the movement of individual features, but also the shape changes that affect the individual parts, um, in particular the form changes uh, and so forth. And we can also load these in as tolerance assumptions, so that if you do, for example, want to change the materials or try out different types of manufacturing processes, you can do that by simply changing the assumption sheet and that will change all of the tolerances within the system and allow you to simulate, uh, to run a simulation um, uh, with different types of materials very quickly and easily. And obviously once we've produced these simulations and you've interactively reviewed them within Aesthetica, you can then produce very high quality images, um, photorealistic images of the variation. And typically what our customers will use this for is for uh, situations where there are borderline perceived quality issues. For example, the gap has varied just slightly outside the acceptable range and they want to do a, a review to make sure that this isn't going to be a problem for the customer. And so they will produce a very high quality photorealistic image to benchmark that. I'm now going to give you some examples uh, and take you through how some of our customers have used our products. And this is probably the best, most concrete example of how Aesthetica uh, is being used. Um, we'll first of all start by taking a look at um, one, of our, uh, uh, one of our earliest customers. And this was uh, uh, General Motors Opel. Um, and they used Aesthetica throughout the development of the Opel Insignia vehicle. Um, it was used all stages of what they call their DTS process, which is the Dimensional Technical Specification process. This is effectively where they uh, identify the technical specification for the gaps and the flush uh, and the way that the parts should fit together. And this is, uh, the software was used for problem resolution, improvement, for visualizing the extreme gaps and testing various different concisions, and also to do comparisons of extreme versus nominal models and to calibrate their auditing uh, images uh, with a, with a number, limited number of samples before producing physical uh, models. And this has allowed them to save a huge amount of money uh, by working on the, uh, the model digitally but with a, a very, very realistic simulation and visualization, they're able to achieve um, a much better and higher quality, uh, a higher perceived quality without uh, resorting to the construction of many physical prototypes. And it's also faster and enabled them to save time and reach decisions a lot more quickly. Now the software was used um, for modeling both the interior and also the exterior of the vehicle. Um, I have some examples here of how the software was used to look at, for example, fascia deformation. And if you look closely at this uh, image, you can see uh, we're animating here between two extreme uh, samples within Aesthetica. Now the effect is quite subtle, but what we're looking at here is the deformation uh, or deformation of components. And this is the deformation of the fascia surrounding the, um, 
both the the, the uh, AC outlets and also the information display in the center. And this deformation comes from its attachment within, or its attachment scheme within uh, the uh, within the instrument panel itself. We can see some more extreme variation on this next image where we can see, for example, deformation across a number of different components as well as variation of, of the fascia unit. This is an extreme example, obviously. Um, uh, you will never see an opal, an opal insignia with this level of variation in. I've exaggerated it for effect here. But you can see how aesthetic could combine the variation of several components. And the, what's driving this variation is the underlying uh, tolerances, is the underlying stack up. Um, so variation within the cross car beam leading to variation in the substructure, leading to variation in the locator schemes for these fascia units, which are then being attached and deformed. And you can see the combination of those changes, which give um, problems in, in a number of different areas on this uh, particular um, build. So we can see on the lower fascia and also on the upper fascia the movement. Okay. And then in this uh, um, third image, we can see as we move down to the lower console, we can see some variation here uh, around the gear stick um, and also around the, uh, the lower ashtray and the, um, the smoking unit. We can see how variation here, not just in position, but also in this case we've got variation in size. And this is particularly noticeable in the surround around the uh, Astra unit, where we've got um, some two extreme variations in size um, of the unit. And we can see how that's affecting the fit and finish and gap and flush um, of that unit, not just to the surrounding units, but also the knock-on effect onto the center console and the gear column, the uh, uh, gear stick and gear column. We've got one final image here, which I wanted to show also on the left hand side uh, from the interior. And we can see here how variation of the upper in, in, uh, instrument panel is affecting the gap and flush around the um, AC uh, unit um, in the upper panel and also off the lower panel we can see some distortion um, around the uh, the dials. I'm just going to highlight those using the spotlight um, in the area I'm indicating here. So you can see it's this area that we're looking at. Um, I need to switch the spotlight off again in order to uh, keep the animation moving. But you can see the range of variation that's occurring in that area. But obviously, um, you can see the effect on the other side of the instrument pack as well. Now, in this image, I'm going to put you to the test. Um, what I'd like you to do is take a look um, at this, uh, at this uh, uh, particular image. Um, and there are a no potentially a number of PQ issues here. Um, if you take a close look at this image, you'll see um, some of these parts aren't quite perfect and it is leading to a number of PQ issues. So I'm going to let you take a look at this image for a, for a few seconds and then we're going to give you a question uh, and we're going to ask you how many perceived quality issues do you think you can find in this image. You will then be given the opportunity to vote for your answer. And we'll take a look at the results of that after the votings come in. So I think that's long enough. Um, let's uh, bring up the question now. And what you should see now is a, a range of answers. So I'd like you to vote for how many issues you believe you could see on that particular image and see how good your PQ skills really are. Once we have all the votes in, uh, 
will bring up the result. Okay. We now have 78% voted, so let's take a look at the results and see what people, what people thought. Okay. Well, that's an interesting, that's an interesting set of results. Most people seem to think there were three issues. Um, so we've got 46%. Interestingly, 11 people, 11% 11 of people thought there were no issues at all, which is kind of interesting. Um, and uh, we've got 7% uh, felt that one, there was one issue. 11% felt there were two, the highest is uh, three, um, and we have 21% who felt there were uh, five issues. So let me just highlight these now um, on, the, uh, on the image, and I'm going to move to the next slide now, and hopefully you can see through the animation uh, and through the uh, result, uh, you can now see uh, the result of that. And what, what we have basically is three issues, as you can see quite clearly. Um, there's an issue around the lower edge. There's an issue um, in the upper, um, around the, uh, the button alignments. Uh, and we also have uh, an issue uh, around the edge of the glove box as well. Now, this is just a simple test of your perceived quality uh, assessment skills, but, but don't be too worried if you didn't get the right answer. As we said before, perceived quality is very much in the eye of the beholder. But when it comes to fit and finish, um, there are many other issues to look for um, in, this, in this particular um, vehicle. Not just, um, in this case, um, looking at variation, but there are also issues to look at in the nominal model as well. Uh, but in this case, the variation uh, that we could see in the original model has led to some fairly extreme conditions, particularly in the lower left-hand corner here around the glove box and the uh, lower fit condition between the two panels. The second example I wanted to uh, review today is that from, uh, is, a, is one from Nissan. Um, and now Nissan again has been a, a, a very um, successfully been using our product now for a number of years. Um, uh, the, they used it throughout the development of the Nissan Qashqai vehicle, which some of you will be familiar with. Um, it's sold um, within Europe. I believe it's also sold uh, in Asia as well, um, uh, possibly also in America now. Um, now, the software was used throughout the development of this vehicle, and um, the result was um, that they managed to achieve the highest perceived quality uh, of any um, vehicle that they'd ever produced. Um, and this, this actually gave rise to um, uh, a publication um, which is available on the Icona website, um, www.iconasolutions.com. If you visit that website, you'll be able to download this, uh, this report that Nissan uh, prepared on the uh, successful use of Aesthetica within their process. Now, Nissan were, uh, were using the product, again, at all stages of the process, from the very early stage, um, where they were looking at uh, the perceived quality targets um, using the Aesthetica uh, review, uh, but also producing their own custom reports to capture those perceived quality targets in a custom report that was then documented and filed alongside the CAD model in the Team Center environment. They were using Aesthetica to identify a number of different issues um, on the interior and also the exterior of the vehicle. Um, I've focused today on the interior because of the range of different plastics and deformable components. And you can see on this particular instance here, we can see the, ra the, the, the uh, range of movement uh, on the upper panel. And we can see how this, the, the, the variation in the locator scheme for these parts gives rise to a, a, a large relative difference uh, between the panel and the, um, the upper air vents, and also to the fascia units um, with respect to uh, 
um, uh, the radio and also the uh, the seatbelt uh, hazard warnings. We can also see here some movement in the lower edge, and this is uh, not just a, um, a, a, a shifting or repositioning of the component. In this particular instance, the component is also twisting, um, which is quite common with plastic components. But that twist has not been picked up by the locator scheme, and it's resulted in uh, a fairly uh, obvious perceived quality problem um, in the upper edge, uh, which has created a problem here. If I use my spotlight, you can see the see-through condition that's created, and also here as well. Now, typically, the uh, items behind this component would be black. In this case, there was a chrome um, or a, a silver clip. Uh, and that was becoming highly visible in this area when the twist uh, came about. And so it's the combination of both material and part behavior and also uh, tolerance variation that you're seeing on this particular part that's giving rise to this perceived quality problem. And remember, this is simulated and visualized purely digitally at a very early stage of the process. So it can be fixed quickly and easily at this stage. Um, they, there's no need to wait till you start building prototype vehicles to see this kind of problem anymore. And here's some quick examples from the exterior of the vehicle. Here we can see the rear tailgate uh, and the alignment of the uh, two lamps, the split uh, tail lamp. Uh, here's in a very extreme condition uh, in the flush. And then taking a look at this um, from uh, by turning the rotating the view, we can also take a look at this from the rear. And here we can this this image is showing the maximum gap uh, in the tailgate compared to the uh, minimum gap we're seeing on the actual lamp. And that gives rise to obviously in the worst case conditions, you've got some really serious disjoint uh, behaviour at the top and bottom of the split tailgate. And Nissan aren't unique in having problems in this area. Uh, pretty much every single manufacturer on the planet that decides to use split tailgate lamps of this nature has similar problems and similar issues in getting the parts lined up and achieving a good fit and finish in this area. An aesthetic it can help, uh, uh, help you get that just right, uh, depending on the quality targets you're achieving for the brand. Now, uh, I'm going to test your powers of observation once more. This is the second poll question. Um, look at the two images you see on the screen here. This is actually taken from a real case study. Um, Nissan, in this case, were uh, at, in discussion with their supplier. And the image on the left is the perfect vehicle, a uh, perfect build. The image on the right is the imperfect vehicle. And this is the worst case condition um, that the uh, supplier uh, would produce. And this was outside the target that was set for Nissan. And Nissan were very worried that this was going to create a problem, a perceived quality problem that the customer would be able to see. Now I'm going to ask you now, if you could take a look at these two images, I'm going to give you two, three questions um, identifying three different areas of this uh, of this model, uh, and I want you to tell me which of those three areas is the one with the problem. So I'll give you another few seconds just to look at the image before we bring the poll question up. The problem is somewhere on this on this model. It's the comparison of the two images. It's it's very obvious when I when I show it to you. Okay, let's bring up the question now. Let's see if you've, you can identify which area has the problem. Now you'll see I've basically, I'm proposing three areas where the problem could exist. Is it the misalignment of the buttons causing a see-through condition? Did you see that on the model? Was it an unacceptable gap between the top of the radio fascia and the upper panel? Perhaps you saw that. Or was it a poor flush condition of the radio fascia relative to the surround. Perhaps that's, that's what you believe is the problem. 
Okay, I'm going to give you a few more seconds. Okay. People are obviously having a good long think about this one. <laughs> I'm just waiting for a good 70, 80 percent. Okay, we've now got over 70 percent people voted. Let's uh, let's take a look at uh, let's close the voting and take a look at the results. Okay, so what we have here is. Uh, 8% of people believe it's a misalignment of the buttons. 31% believe, or a third of people believe, there's unacceptable gap between the top of the radio fascia and the upper panel. And we have uh, two thirds, or 60%, believe it's poor flush condition of the radio fascia relative to the surround. Okay, I'm not going to show you the issue, so uh, just move to the next slide. And for the 60% of you who said it was the uh, flush condition on the surround, uh, congratulations, uh, you'd make superb Nissan perceived quality assessment engineers. Um, in practice, what we found was uh, when they put this to the customer, uh, very few of the customers could actually see the difference between could not could actually see the difference um, although clearly there is a a big difference between um, between the nominal and the maximum. This was actually only point two millimeters outside the Nissan target uh, for the part now because the uh, result of their customer trial was that the customers really, about 90% of the customers could not tell the difference. They decided to go with the supplier's recommendation and save themselves quite a lot of money um, because this was judged as a borderline perceived quality issue and not worth spending uh, the huge quantity of money that they would have had to have spent to improve the manufacturing process for this particular part. Now the next example I wanted to just briefly uh, discuss is Bentley. Bentley again are um, good customers of Aesthetica, they've been using our software for a number of years um, and are also using it uh, for interior and exterior work, uh, using it at a very early stage of the process to assess the impact of variation, um, not just at engineering stage but also to influence the design and whether certain split line concepts um, will deliver a more robust design than others. They use a perceived quality um, assessment process within the advanced, what they call advanced engineering, which is effectively the stage just after the concept has been signed off at the point where they're starting to turn uh, the initial styling surfaces into real CAD geometry. And at this stage, they need to set very clear quality targets they need to visualize and maintain the characteristics that the stylists have brought through. So they want to visualize gap and flush, radii, and different types of material finishes, but not just the on the nominal model, also looking at the variation within the model that's going to affect um, the fit and finish. And they use Aesthetica together with, um, uh, sorry, they use Aesthetica models based on early locator schemes using virtual features and A-class surfaces to understand the effects and behavior of components at a very early stage. And the benefit, obviously, is that they reduce sensitivity in the model at a very early stage. It allows them to focus on the feasible concepts and discard those that are just clearly not going to deliver the quality that they require, and also to reduce downstream rectification significantly. And the conclusions of using Aesthetica now for um, uh, over three years is that they've managed to increase perceived quality and customer satisfaction while also reducing um, the number of surprises um, that they, they encounter later on in the process by, effective, uh, by effectively getting the product right first time through the process. And that we're delivering more effective decision taking because teams can see the issue 
can discuss it, can see the issues, sorry, and discuss them and review them and take a decision very quickly. A few iterations of the model while also including better cross-functional commitment at an early stage. So there are a large number of benefits that Bentley have, under, have, have enjoyed, not just in terms of qualitative benefits, but also real quantitative benefits as well. And they've used it for interior as well as exterior to review fit and finish and to do not just um, assessment of targets, um, but also assessment of um, uh, the, the, the initial locator schemes. Now the next example I'm going to talk about is Fiat. Um, Fiat have been uh, using the pro using Aesthetica uh, primarily for interiors, um, and and a lot of those images you've probably seen in this webinar now are focused on interiors. Um, and they used it in order to um, they've used it on interiors because obviously that's where they're seeing the biggest form variation uh, with the uh, uh, with the build uh, and with the real product itself. And they use it to review fit and finish of interior, to identify worst case examples, and, and also to understand the root causes of variation. So they're using aesthetic simulation capability to understand what's causing the variation to try out potential solutions by making changes to locators, to materials, to surfaces, um, even to uh, the, 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 the assembly process itself. And successful solutions can then be documented very quickly using a standard documentation um, and then sent out to the design teams or engineering teams or even to the suppliers. So I've touched on a few examples there, um, including uh, Bentley, Nissan, um, but we do have a, a large number of customers, including Chrysler, um, we, were, we have uh, Ferrari, Lotus, etc. See just a selection of them here on the screen. And that, uh, I'd just like to now conclude by just identifying the key characteristics that I wanted to bring out. Aesthetica and Icona Solutions has been delivering uh, our solution to industry now for uh, a number of years. And we have, and for every single client that has picked up and used our product, they've been able to not just uh, achieve, but exceed the PQ targets that they've set. Um, it delivers innovation through giving early insight into the effects of variation. It delivers what-if studies so that you can actually come up with innovative solutions at a much earlier stage of the process when you can create and you can come up with design solutions, engineering, manufacturing solutions, and you have a full range of options to be able to fix problems. It enables better collaboration because obviously it's highly visual, so decisions can be made quickly and complex issues can be visualized and shared by teams in an unambiguous way. And ultimately, it delivers reduced time, cost, and risk by enabling critical engineering issues to be resolved and identified at a very early stage, you do avoid this costly and late um, uh, maturation, you might call it, at the end of the process, where production issues constantly plague and delay the release of new vehicles. This can be completely avoided through the use of this, this technology earlier in the process. So that summarizes uh, the main points I wanted to raise today. Um, I'd now like to uh, open up the, um, the the webinar to uh, the question and answer session. Um, and I'll hand right. back to Eric now. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. That was um, really a fascinating presentation. Um, and uh, it's really good to see Aesthetic basically provides uh, early insight into um, in order to overcome some production issues pertaining to perceived quality and craftsmanship, I'm sure the uh, attendees um, really enjoyed that presentation. I, I, I did want to um, just uh, touch, obviously, on uh, a few questions that have come in. Um, one, early, one question that came in early on was from uh, Amrit Pal Singh, who asked, um, 
and you may actually have covered this already in your presentation because this, this question came very early. Um, how does Aesthetica deal with unique grain patterns and colors for OEMs? Um, okay, well within the software obviously we can represent a range of different materials. Um, uh, different types of grain, for example, would be represented using uh, a particular bump map material. So that could either be, um, typically you would do that by uh, taking an image of the technical grain and then effectively processing that image to produce both a, a texture and a bump map that you would use within the material. And then that is then texture mapped onto the, uh, onto the component or the product or the part which is going to have that, um, that type of uh, finish. Now our customers will normally create their own libraries so they would have a range of different technical grains or leather finishes or so on um, that they would take images of and then create their own material libraries from and then they would reuse those over and over again when building models. Um, we can then pass that same material across to other visualization systems who you wish to export from Aesthetica into other tools such as Delta Gen or Showcase uh, or Bunk Speed Hypershop. Right, that's, it's uh, again very interesting how um, we spoke about the integration with uh, Katia, Isom, Serp and Alias which can all be read by Aesthetica. Um, Another question, uh, actually um, this, this is an answer really for Ahmed Pal uh, again who uh, wrote us from Tata Motors. Um, this, uh, this presentation will be available to you uh, and indeed anyone else uh, online. So um, you know, uh, John doesn't need to actually email it to you. You can find it readily available on Cardesign News um, under the process tab in the future. Um, so another, another question that came through was how does Aesthetica simulate the imperfect model? What sorts of parameters are needed to be input into the software? This is from Zenbo Pan. Okay. Um, okay. Well, well, typically, in order to simulate variation, you can we can simulate Aesthetica can simulate it based on um, one of two uh, methods. You can either uh, simulate variation based on what you want to achieve which is basically target driven. So you can, you can say I want to move my components um, to achieve um, uh, uh, this type of, these, this set of targets and show me what it will look like if I uh, have these extreme positions or uh, uh, shapes. So you can, you can, it can be target driven. The alternative is it can be based on the real manufacturing process. Uh, and in order to uh, simulate variation based on the real manufacturing process and, and effectively answer the questions of what will it look like if when I make it. Um, in order to do that you, you can use either um, tolerances, uh, what we call GD and T tolerances, geometric dimension and tolerances, um, which you input by hand if you wish, or you can input data directly from the manufacturing line. So if you have measurement data or live measurement data coming off the manufacturing line, you can import that as a spreadsheet inside Aesthetica and then apply that to the components so they move based on the real manufacturing capability. So simulating imperfection, as I said, can be done based on, uh, to summarize, just it can be based on what you want to achieve or what you will achieve. And, and Aesthetica gives you the combination, gives you the ability to build models from both of those those two different perspectives and then compare them to see this is what I want, this is what I'm going to get, how can I get what I want, if you see what I mean. Right, thanks for that John. Um, Makrand from uh, GM India is writing, John is there a focus on assessing if a particular grain can be applied on the part with varying depth depending on the available draft on the part? And the, the second part of his question is how much appearance issues can be resolved by Aesthetica? Uh, so could you just re restate the first part of that question? I didn't sure. Quite catch She's it. asking, is there a focus on assessing if a particular grain can be applied on the part with varying depth depending on the available draft in the part? Okay, okay. Um, 
that is it's a lovely guess. I would say uh, it is possible to do that kind of assessment. I wouldn't say that's something that our customers um, spend a lot of time on. It is possible to do this because you can effectively change the depth of the grain by controlling the material. Um, so it is possible to look at different depths of grain uh, and to assess you know, how, how different depths of grain are going to, going to appear in certain gaps and flush conditions. Because obviously the deeper the grain, the more pronounced the shadows and so forth. Um, so, so, so yes, it is possible to do that level. Um, and just remind me what the second part of the question was. The second part is, um, yes, how much appearance issues can be resolved by Aesthetica? Well, ultimately, that's, ex that's precisely, it's, it's all of the appearance issues that, that, that Aesthetica is designed to, to, to help you resolve. Um, now, primarily, it's appearance issues related to variation in the product in some form. So, for example, variation in the material or variation in the shape or variation in the position. Um, so, or variation in the color, for example. Um, so, it is, it is designed to allow you to assess variation in all the different forms relative to the, to, to the nominal. So, um, I mean, it, it, it is designed for all of those, all of the above, I would say. Okay, um, another question coming in from Ivan uh, Santos asks, are PQ targets more influenced by consumer perception or by the manufacturer issues in companies? Uh, it, uh, whew, that's, well, I, in experience, I mean, obviously the consumer um, expectations are very much the driver of the PQ targets. Um, but also there's a factor in this which it's, it's not just about the consumer, it's also about what the competition is doing as well. So benchmarking and teardowns are obviously an important part of that. You know, what, what is my, I'm going for a particular uh, market with a particular type of vehicle. The first thing most automotive companies will do is see what everyone else is doing in that market and what gap targets are they using. Um, and then they will take a look and say, okay, well, do we want to go one better or do we want to achieve exactly the same? Um, and then they will take a look at their processes to see, can we deliver that? Um, so it, it, that tends to be the, the decision process. But, um, but obviously the ultimate deciding factor is the consumer. So if you, if, if you find even if the competition isn't quite meeting what the consumer wants, there is a, an opportunity there for, a, for a, an OEM to come in with a better quality that the, or, or meet that consumer demand more precisely. So it's, it's kind of everything, it's all of the above, but it, it's, it, the, the consumer is the ultimate decider. Okay, thanks for that, John. Uh, another question coming from uh, Olivier Cazot. Um, how much time do you need to realize a complete model of a new complete car? Okay, um, for a complete vehicle, um, well, typically um, our customers don't tend to build a complete vehicle within Aesthetica they, because they, they tend to build focused sections of the vehicle which they're going to look at. And the classic areas that they look at tend to be the front quarter, the rear quarter for the exterior, uh, maybe the A pillar and C pillar sections. Um, uh, and in the interior, it tends to be the instrument panel, um, the interface between the I instrument panel and the door, uh, uh, inner uh, panel, uh, and so forth. So there tends to be fairly focused areas where they focus their, their energy for a particular study. Um, now, in most, in most cases, to build an entire vehicle would take quite a, quite a long time, but to build them for these focused areas, typically our customers spend uh, between a few hours to uh, uh, two or three days, or maybe, maybe up to a week at most. Um, but typically, it's, it's the models that take a few hours that deliver the best results, because those are the ones that are, based, that are quick, easy to build, and can be refreshed very, very quickly and easily, and deliver the results the most uh, in the most uh, timely manner. So those tend to be the most popular studies that people do, and and quite often they will try to reuse the data as much as possible. So reusing live measurement data or locator sets from other models um, in order to save themselves a lot of time. Okay. 
All right, John, thank you for that. Um, got another question here. Um, can Aesthetica use a surface geometry only without any understructure geometry? Um, okay, well, I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hand this question over to Phil. Um, and let him um, uh, answer this one because uh, Phil's dealt a lot more with the A-class and uh, virtual substructures, so I'll let him deal with this uh, question. Thanks, John. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, Aesthetic can use uh, A-class geometry only, as opposed to some of the more traditional uh, dimensional analysis tools where we've had to build up the entire model uh, part by part from the very base level based on tolerances. As, uh, as John has mentioned, we can apply, in Aesthetica, we can apply A-class surfaces to, uh, to a structure made up of uh, either um, dimensional, uh, dimensional measured data from a previous similar model, um, or we can, we can base assumptions on, uh, on typical uh, variations for a body shell less door structure, and simply apply A-class surfaces to that. What that means is that we can use Aesthetica very, very early in the design process before we have any uh, any tolerance data um, that would enable us to, to look at locator strategies and target setting very early on. So yeah, absolutely, we can we can use Aesthetica without any understructured geometry. Thanks for that, Phil. Um, I've got a few other questions here. How can you measure the material effectiveness on virus sensory perception coming from Antonio? Do you have an answer for that one? Um, that's that's a, that's that's a, a, well. That's I would say that's fairly complex. It, it's a simple question, but it's got a fairly complex answer. Um, uh, it might be better to deal with that one directly, I would say. <laughs> um, okay, I think, there's a few, um, I think there's a few uh, people here that we'll put you in touch with. Um, particular, I'm, I'm okay. uh, from Tata, is, um, he's asked several questions, and uh, obviously I, I want to give um, enough people time to respond okay. to the questions that have been asked. Um, so I'm going, to, uh, I'm going to ask you another question. Um, what level of geometry maturity is required in Aesthetica? Um, okay, well, um, following on from the last question, really, um, it, it's typically the, the, the minimum you require is some A-class surface data. Um, it's, 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 um, it would, it's ideal, but not essential to have the radiuses uh, on that data. Um, obviously, if you're going to be measuring gap and flush, uh, it's useful to have the the, the 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 rads and the fillets on the edges of the geometry. But obviously, it's still possible to do studies even without that rad and fillet on. So, even at the very early stage where you may have surface initial block surfaces that you've uh, scanned in and you've put some initial split lines on those block surfaces to represent, for example, this I'm talking about the body exterior now. So you may have just split the block surface down into the fender, the body side, um, etc. Um, even at that stage, even with that initial surface, um, it is possible to start doing some early studies because you can take those initial uh, split surfaces and you can attach them virtually to uh, an underbody locator set. For example, if you're doing a, a carryover vehicle, which is a sorry a, 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 a redesign of a vehicle that's already on the market, and you're not going to change the underlying substructure or the chassis, uh, you, you effectively want to redesign the the, the look and, look and finish and feel of the vehicle just by changing these surfaces um, and making a few of the minor changes. Um, so for that type of program, um, this is. This is perfect because you can you can take an say an initial block surface with split lines, attach it to the locator set for the existing vehicle, and be do studies within you know one to two months of having the initial concepts. You can even do studies on several different concepts at the same time to see which ones which split lines are going to give the uh, most robust solution to variation. So. Even at that level of geometry, it's possible to start doing studies, and then obviously, from that stage on, the geometry just becomes more sophisticated. So, you know, obviously, 
at every stage of the process from then on, you can be using Aesthetic. Hope that helps. Okay, um, <coughs> thank you. Uh, another another question was, uh, who uses Aesthetica? Is it a designer, a product engineer, or a geometer? Um, designer, product engineer. It's well. I mean, the, the simple answer is, um, it, it it typically the user is um, someone who is responsible for. Um, setting uh, and achieving the perceived quality or gap and flush targets uh, um, within within the vehicle itself. So at an early stage, uh, it varies from company to company depending on the roles, but typically at every stage of the process, someone is responsible for the targets of the vehicle and for achieving those targets. Uh, sorry, for setting and achieving those targets. So at the early stage, uh, you have teams involved in setting the targets and that could be the designers themselves or it could be a separate quality team that design that set those targets on behalf of design and say okay this is what you know design come up with the surfaces we come up with a quality target um, so it could be a separate quality team early on as you move further down into the process again quality it could be uh, main there should there could be a, a separate perceived quality team, there could be, um, uh, or it could be the product engineers themselves that do the quality management and, and do we, are we achieving those quality targets. Um, it, as I say, it varies from company to company. Um, if we take, for example, Nissan, they have a dedicated perceived quality team at design, engineering and production stage, and it's their responsibility to make sure that the design and the, so the model as it evolves is able to achieve the targets that were set early on uh, and to make sure that the targets that are set are feasible. So they're the main users of Aesthetica. But then if you look at Opal, uh, sorry, um, um, uh, to, to Opal, then the main users there are the uh, what we call the DTS engineers, the dimensional technical specification engineers. And then again, they're, they're kind of a separate team, but their role is to set the targets and then manage those targets throughout the process. So they work with the engineers, work with the designers to make sure that the model, as it evolves, is going to meet those those targets and be delivered with consistent quality uh, uh, once it goes into production. So I can't I can't really pin down one role and say that's the person who will use it. All I can say is yeah. it what, tends what to about, be what about the type of experience? What about the type of experience that? Uh, the users might might require need. Okay, sure. Um, again, that that depends on the type of studies they're going to do. At the early stage, if it's based on targets, um, typically the uh, as as long as uh, our users have had some exposure or use have used some kind of CAD system or surface modeling system, then they won't have a problem learning Aesthetica. Um, you don't need to be an expert in perceived quality or an expert in target setting or an expert in tolerancing. Um, at that stage, for the target setting point of view, um, uh, as I say, it's just, just some uh, acquaintance with the CAD, with the PDM system is, is sufficient. As you get further into the process, obviously, and you start building up, uh, if, if you choose to go down the route of building tolerance models, then obviously the engineer needs to have some knowledge of tolerancing um, to build those, those models. But the other option is to bypass that completely and import the measurement data from manufacturing, and then you don't need to build the full tolerance stack. And in that situation, you don't need engineers with a deep understanding of tolerance in order to be able to build very realistic simulations. It can just be typically a, a, a CAD engineer, a part, engi sorry, a, a part engineer with knowledge of how the assembly process is going to work. Okay. All right, John, thank you. Um, I just want to wrap things up with a few more questions here. Um, sure. if, uh, if a user doesn't have all of the required data, um, can they still use Aesthetica? Um, well, obviously, the, the only absolutely required data is the geometry. Um, uh, beyond that, um, you can you can put everything else in manually within the software. So, um, to do the absolute, the bare minimum you need um, is some geometry uh, and um, basically some 
some, some targets or some idea of what your targets should be. Uh, and then you can build an initial target study model. So even at that stage, even with just the bare geometry, which is the minimum requirement really, uh, you can start to build models. Okay. Um, and another question, can the texture map be developed within Aesthetica or can I import the material library from Showcase? Um, Teams alias or Autodesk rather Showcase is a, is a good tool. Is that your main tool to perform received quality uh, reviews? Uh, well, pe people typically use our own software, use Aesthetica to do the actual review. They, they'll revert to something like Showcase or Delta Gen for those borderline issues where you really need to see the product in a real world setting in order to make that final, very fine level of judgment. But for most cases, Aesthetica's visualization is, is good enough for the desktop and for users taking the decisions. Now, in terms of textures, um, uh, our system, you can load the textures into Aesthetica, so you can create new materials where, uh, where you load and import the textures in. So if you have some textures within Showcase that you want to use in Aesthetica, then you can, you can load those textures in as images and create your own material based on those. <coughs> okay, that, that's, brilliant. That's Thank you. Uh, one, one final question then. Um, is uh, in terms of your return on investment, what, what's the typical return on investment that your customers achieve using Aesthetica? Um, again, again it, it depends how widely they're using the tool. Um, I mean, we, just, just to give a very simple example, um, Nissan, when they first started using the product in North America, um, used the tool on uh, one particular program to do a study. Um, uh, it, was, it was really to fix a problem with a tailgate um, and they managed to avoid making a change to the tool, uh, to the actual stamping to pressing tool, um, by effectively studying the, the model in Aesthetica and coming up with an alternative uh, change in the assembly that would deliver uh, the same result as the tooling change, but at a lower cost. Um, now, because they were able to do that in Aesthetica and avoid the tooling change, the actual return on investment just on that one study alone um, was in excess of, uh, it's in excess of $800,000, and that was just in one study. Um, so, so typically, even just in the single studies um, that we've, we've been involved in, um, we're looking at a sort of 10, to, between 10 and 20 times uh, return on investment just on individual studies alone. So when you multiply that up over a number of programs and being used consistently at every stage, um, you get to a point where, you know, you're into, um, you know, hundreds of times of return on investment typically. All right. Well, that's, uh, that's a really good um, number to be coming up with. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask one more question here. There's a few more that came through recently. Um, according to, uh, well, the design director here says, only wants to use uh, nominal data and physical models. Everything else is up to engineering. How do I persuade him to consider your solution? Okay. Um, no, I think, uh, I, I think I, I, I'll, uh, I'll ask... Uh, Tim uh, Illingworth, um, our CEO, to, to uh, 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 contribute at this stage. Um, this is something which I know he's familiar with. Um, so, uh, Tim, would you Hi. like to? Yeah, it's, uh, uh, thanks very much. It's Tim Illingworth. Yeah, I, I, there's a number of, uh, of answers to that. <coughs> Typically, um, I would say many of the companies that are using our solution in the design environment uh, have only considered nominal models in the past. They use the physical models to see what the clay's like, etc., and then hand over the fence, as it were, to engineering. Um, but design departments that have actually used our solution um, have found significant benefit in that the actual design and the way they want the design to appear to the consumer um, is significantly enhanced and achieved by using our solution because clearly the variation and deformation that occurs through uh, engineering and manufacturing 
um, can, can spoil that design and can make sure that what was uh, drawn originally doesn't exist um, in, in its physical appearance. So what I would say to him is that uh, I think he should embrace this type of solution to have a look at it. It complements the solutions and the processes he's got and I would suggest to him uh, will we'll pay back significantly. You don't need to be an engineer. You, as John explained, the target fitting studies are very easy to do. They don't need engineering. You don't need material properties, etc. And uh, they bring significant benefit very quickly, early in the process, including at the design stage. Great. Thanks for that, Tim. Um, one final question then, uh, probably for you. How are you different to the other dimensional management solutions available? Okay. Um, now, once again, I, I think I'm going to um, I'm going to pass this one on to, um, to to Phil Coleman because he's got a lot of experience with um, other tools as well as uh, Aesthetica. So he's 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 in a very good position to compare and contrast. Thank you, John. Perfect. Um, I would say that there, there's quite a number of, uh, of difference between Aesthetica and, and the other dimensional analysis tools available. Um, the primary one is that the focus of Aesthetica really is on the visualization of geometrical variation as opposed to many of the other uh, dimensional analysis tools where the, uh, the output would be a table of, of numbers and statistics. Aesthetica is very much focused on providing a visual result, a visual output. Um, really as the customer would perceive, perceive the result. Um, although, of course, statistical results uh, are possible and we can generate those, as, as, Jen, as John mentioned uh, in, his, uh, uh, in his seminar. But another difference is that uh, we can take the design targets uh, and real measured data, again, as mentioned before, uh, as inputs into our, into our tolerance studies into our studies rather than the rather than building up from the tolerance data of in individual parts. Um, again, this enables the aesthetica to be used very early, uh, really at the design process stage, rather than having to wait until engineering can be involved. Um, and we can we can use the tool to uh, to make uh, good and uh, understandable uh, targets for for gap and flush measurements. Um, the, the final main difference that I mentioned is that uh, Aesthetica is the function to uh, deform geometry both during uh, an analysis and to show those results in an output so that we can see the impact of flexible parts. This is a function that's, um, that's not so well developed in, in some of the other dimensional analysis uh, packages and, uh, and really is a, is a great advantage, particularly when we're modeling uh, A-class features such as bumpers. Um, where there is a large degree of flexibility uh, interior, where there's uh, a number of uh, deformable plastics as well. It really, is, uh, it really is a big advantage. Okay, thanks, right. Phil. Well, Phil, on, on that note, thank you so much um, for, for answering that question. It's, uh, again, a really um, amazing product to see what can be done um, just by, by using Aesthetica in order to uh, um, really further the, uh, the perceived quality and the craftsmanship quality as well um, within vehicle interiors, but indeed the whole vehicle that, uh, as a whole. Um, and uh, I wanted to thank you, Phil, John, and, uh, and Tim as well, um, and, and everyone else. Thank you very much for joining us today. Um, as I mentioned earlier, this uh, webinar will be uploaded to, uh, to our archives and accessible in the future. So all of your colleagues who haven't been able to attend the live presentation, or indeed if you want to go and, and access this uh, or any other previous webinar that we've done, um, they're all available under the press process tab on the Car Design News home page. So uh, on that note, uh, thanks again for joining us today. And we hope you'll join us again for our next webinar, which is going to take place at the end of the month. So thanks again. John, Phil, and Tim, and uh, thanks to everyone else uh, for attending. <laughs>